According to the report, engagement with and cooperation from street performers are equally essential to enforcement. There are multiple requests over its 114 pages to increase enforcement powers and resources, but nowhere does it suggest any method of how to get the buskers more on board. Well, an apology would be a good start. There's a chance that none of the errors highlighted so far were intentional. Still, people apologise for their own mistakes, conscious or not, it's part of British culture. So here's a short summary of the things so far that the council could, or should, apologise for. Showing that complaints before the licence were lower than they actually were. Muddying the stats to hide the fact that complaints have been below average for months. Not giving the proper context for why complaints initially went up in 2021. Stealing a quarter of a million pounds by illegally not paying the PRS licence, if indeed they haven't. At best, straying over ethical boundaries by asking about union membership status. Pretending the policy was self-regulated. Pretending the policy was light touch. Ignoring that they criminalised most of the shows in Covent Garden. Actually, if we pause the apologies just for a second, I want to quickly note that since I made the earlier part of the video about the fact that the council criminalised the majority of the shows put on by members of the Covent Garden SPA, I had this back and forth with the council. Me. There are no visas that cover busking. Them. Actually, here's a link to where they can get confirmation of the right to work. I checked out that link and it says that the buskers need either a residence card or a visa. Me. But travelling buskers won't have a residence card or a visa, so that link doesn't work. So, has Westminster banned travelling street performers? Them. Yes, unfortunately, we cannot permit travelling visitors to perform as a busker. The council's licensing regime began on April 5th, 2021. We had that conversation on September 15th, 2023, 893 days later. And I believe that this is the first time that the council has ever written publicly that internationally travelling street performers are banned from busking in Westminster. In fact, it sounds like this might be the first time the council realised that it has banned internationally travelling street performers. Let's just take a minute to read the first paragraph of the council's December 2020 report. Located in the heart of central London, Westminster's streets are brought to life with performances by buskers who come from all over the world to perform here and play an important role in the vibrancy of our city. That's paragraph 1.1, page 1. I think that the council accidentally banned travelling buskers. Just straight up banned one of the best things about London's street scene by accident. I have asked the council whether this was an oversight or intentional, and hopefully they'll get back to me before I've reached the end of making this video. But in any case, this just adds weight to why the Covent Garden Street Performers Association suggested that buskers ignore the licensing regime. Which leads us back to our apology list. The council should also apologise for suggesting that buskers who didn't get a licence might be tax-dodging criminals, ignoring the incredible success the Covent Garden SPA had at reducing noise complaints, using non-relevant complaints as grounds to say that self-regulation doesn't work on pitches managed by the SPAs, and publishing a single, one-sided, exaggerated and flawed impact report by a business that really doesn't know what it is that makes Leicester Square special. As for the four possible crimes that the council has committed, possibly lying in a legal opinion, possibly avoiding paying a music royalties licence, possibly going against data protection laws, and possibly breaking union discrimination laws, perhaps instead of an apology, the police should just investigate and take it from there. They should also apologise for trying to eliminate the street performers associations. Back in 2020, the council set up a forum for discussions about the new licensing regime. It was described as a bridge between the busking community and our local residents and businesses in order to foster good relations and open communication and to promote partnership. Sounds good, but for some reason in 2023, now they're saying that business and residents associations should be excluded from the forum, as well as unlicensed buskers. It is believed, it says, that a new forum should be established which is specifically for licensed buskers. Instead of a bridge to a local community, the forum will now just be a communication channel between licensed buskers and the council's enforcement team. That may not sound like a direct attack on the street performers associations until you read the report's 15th recommendation that direct references to the two current SPAs should be removed from the policy, because the policy should only promote SPAs who represent licensed buskers. 
What happened to the Council's 2020 claim that they will continue to support established and newly created SBAs across the city who play a vital and important role in supporting engagement between performers and with the wider community to foster good relations with all users of the shared public space? And is the Council really saying that they'll only engage with street performers associations who mandate that 100% of their members get licenses? And if that wasn't enough, the report then recommends that the Council should consider listing recognised SPAs as well as their contact information on the Council's website. That's Machiavellian. The Council will no longer speak to the current street performer associations, they will no longer mention those two SPAs on its policy document, and if a future SPA wants to get such privileges, they can, but only if they agree, to solely represent licensed street performers. But what about the Leicester Square SPA? The 2023 report states that their members were mostly licensed, expressed a willingness to collaborate, and the Council's own officers even suggested engaging with them. It also says that officers met with the LSSPA on several occasions during this review. They were very helpful in discussing the issues that they have had with the licensing scheme and policy, as well as considering the issues that businesses have faced in and around Leicester Square. Sounds like the Council would agree to collaborate, just so long as the Leicester Square Street Performers Association makes a rule change that 100% of their members have to get a busking license. Great, so let's do a thought experiment. Let's say that the Leicester Square SPA makes that change. Any of their members and representatives who don't have a license promptly get one, and the Council agrees to list them on the policy and resume conversations. What happens if, a year or two into the future, the Council decides it doesn't like a representative of the SPA and cancels their busking license? Should that busker immediately be evicted from the SPA? Are they immediately fired from SPA leadership? Do council officers really believe that they should have veto powers over who gets to be on the other side of the table during negotiations? The report's authors evidently know how awful they're being. It's why they keep slipping into the passive voice. For example, the concept of SBAs is still seen as a positive and worth supporting by the council, however, it was emphasised that SPA should only represent licensed buskers, or it is believed that a new forum should be established which is specifically for licensed buskers. It's at these moments, when the report slips into externalising views onto nameless sources, that its authors sound at their most insidious. The rest of the aforementioned miscalculations and misinterpretations of the law could conceivably be mistakes. Maybe even the council's insulting history of busking should get a pass but trying to meddle with the governing rules of a trade association, while writing it as if it's an accepted viewpoint established by outsiders rather than their own opinion, well, it is believed that these are the words of some bitter employees trying to mislead the council. I'm going to leave out the names and the actions of individual council officials who the buskers believe are to blame for all of this, or the evidence that has stacked up against them. This video is long enough already and that information can be handed over to the press. But. I've been shown an email thread where one Covent Garden SPA representative tried, repeatedly, from November 20th, 2022 until August 3rd, 2023, a period of eight and a half months, to get the council to walk around town with the SBA to discuss specific pitch issues. He was either ignored or rebuffed every time. Here's how the report talks about the CG SPA cooperation. All attempts to engage with the Covent Garden Street Performers Association failed. That's got things backwards. All attempts to engage with the council failed. The same council that didn't even meet its own obligation of holding a twice annual forum. Whomever is writing this stuff needs to stop, take a breath, and apologize. Otherwise, I really can't imagine how the SBAs will be able to move on. The next one is a small point. Well, actually, it's quite a large point, but one that can be made quickly. The council needs to apologise for not letting buskers know that they couldn't work. Westminster only has five amplified pitches. As we've already covered, many shows require amplification nowadays, and the Traffic Island and Marble Arch pitches were put in awful locations, which means that there is a lot of competition for the remaining three. But also, the St Paul's pitch is used exclusively by street theatre shows, the comedy circus style shows with big audiences, and it's been that way since the 1980s. That leaves just Trafalgar Square and Leicester Square for amplified musicians, dancers and so on to compete over. Over the last couple of years, the report notes that Trafalgar Square was closed for events for roughly 59 days per year. Leicester Square was closed for roughly 154 days. Do the maths, and we see that buskers could expect both Trafalgar Square and Leicester Square pitches to be closed at the same time about 25 days per year. 
Actually, according to the buskers, pitch closures are generally more common on weekends and during the summer and winter tourism spikes, so the real number of dual closures is likely higher, and on average, on high earning days. But anyway, approximately 25 times a year, hundreds of street performers would pack up their equipment, leave home, and commute into town only to find that there's nowhere that they can legally busk. According to the report, 70% of street performers had no idea how to check for pitch closures because the council didn't tell them. So the report recommends, two years too late mind you, that the council should consider additional communication options about pitch closures. Considering the council sold buskers the right to busk in their borough, the report should probably also have recommended giving their licensees an apology. Okay, I know what you're thinking, I'm really scraping the bottom of the apology barrel, so let's switch it up again. The report's authors recommend a change to the rules so that buskers can lose their licenses for directing, quote, offensive language at authorized officers or the police. They call this unacceptable behavior. That might be their opinion, but even the House of Lords thought that anybody should be allowed to insult anyone, including the police, when they voted to change the terms of the Public Order Act of 1986. It would seem that the House of Lords is more anti-establishment than whichever council officer wrote this. But that's nothing compared to point F in this list, which is so out there, I wouldn't be surprised to discover it's a crime for the council to even suggest it. The report recommends that buskers shall fully cooperate with any investigation carried out by the council or the police in response to reported incidents or allegations of unacceptable behavior. And that fully cooperating would include assisting in the identification of any involved parties being investigated. In plain English, lose your license or rat on your friends. How's that for cooperation and engagement? And finally, the council should apologize for passing this legislation and having it go into effect during the catastrophe that was COVID. At the time, dozens of live performance venues had permanently gone out of business across the UK and a hundred more establishments would follow. Indoor venues were decimated by COVID. The Great Outdoors was considered the one COVID safe venue when lockdowns ended and many artists had nowhere else to perform. COVID also wiped out an entire year's worth of artists' earnings. Buskers obviously didn't benefit from the government's furlough scheme or their super spreader eat out to help out scheme and they couldn't apply for any of the arts grants that were out there. They weren't even invited to perform at the parties going on at number 10. The entire busking community was experiencing an unprecedented level of stress and hardship and nobody knew what was going to happen. And at that point, in the middle of a lockdown, the council passed legislation that made their shows illegal, ending, for many, any hope that the future would be brighter than the present. It was just brutal. 